Your Eminence, what made you write a book on the spiritual life? Well, amidst the confusion of this day, outside and even inside the church, I saw a need for a representation of some reflections on our spiritual progress in our spiritual life, progress in our personal and intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. It is not a catechism to compete with the Catechism of Catholic Church, but narrower in, in scope, I hope answering a profound need of our time. Every one of us must strive continuously to draw closer to Jesus Christ, to return to his word, and to the simplicity of the faith in his self-revelation. It is the simplicity of the desert, of recognition of our dependence upon God, and encountering him and the gift of his love and his grace by which he configured us to himself. That is why I decided to write a catechism for spiritual, uh, spiritual life. And, and why, why would you say does the, um, the spiritual life need a catechism? Well, God has been forgotten in the modern society. We all live as if God doesn't exist. Confusion reigns everywhere. Too many would reduce our lives, the very meaning of our lives, to isolate individualism, pursuing fleeting pleasure, In this situation, then, we require a retreat from the world, a withdrawal into the desert, where we can relearn the fundamentals, the basics, I mean monotheism, the revelation of Jesus Christ, us and God. How does one enter word, and progress into spiritual life and how does this path differ from, let's say, a non-spiritual life? Dependence and need of His mercy. Through the church, through His church and the sacrament, God guides us into ever deeper relationship with Him. And we all have a need to reacquaint ourselves with his profound gift, which is his love. So we need a catechism because we need to approach deeper and deeper to God. And can you tell us a little bit, because you also um, described this in your book, um, how does one enter and how does one progress into spiritual life? And how does this path maybe differ from a, let's call it a non-spiritual life? We enter into spiritual life by following Christ. He turns us toward Him by His grace, 
we are lead, led by him. And like the Hebrews, he leads us into the desert. There is a characteristic of the spiritual life. There is no illusion of self-sufficiency, no false sense of security. We are justified only by Christ. We depend on him. He is our rock. And the word of God is our firm foundation. This is another characteristic of spiritual life. Worldly life is built on sand. Without God's word, people can think that they live an upright life, but it is illusory. The principle and values of moral law and meet and find his reconciliation only by Christ. Human reason requires God's help. Without God, we can, we can live any just life, any, any vital life. We need God. You describe the sacraments as pillars of the spiritual life also. And um, is, are those sacraments, are those pillars of spiritual life, do you think they're present enough in our daily lives, even of the faithful? Um, do you think we need more time or also more efforts to explain the sacraments as, as pillars of spiritual life and bring them to the attention of maybe our modern society, of modern men? Sure, the sacraments remain part of the life of the faithful. But their significance have been forgotten or obscured by worldly concern. We need to, res to rediscover these are the principal means of grace that Jesus established in his church. We need to understand the sacrament. They are not social affairs. Baptism, for example, could not be delayed to wait for a familiar, family, fam, family re, uh, meeting. But parents must haste to baptize the children because the baptism is really the gate to the spiritual life, to, a gate to enter in the church. Each of the seven sacraments are a gift of the church to illuminate how God intervene in our lives for the sake of our salvation. So we need to explain more deeply what is baptism, what is confirmation, what is Eucharist, not only a meeting for family, uh, you know. So it's a, this is why I wrote this book, to deepen our knowledge of the sacraments. But you also write about the loss of faith and the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Why do you see especially this loss of faith? Why do you see this as a cause for the decline of Christian communities? And how could we revive this faith? I know that without faith in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, the church becomes a wholly horizontal phenomena. 
the church loses the meaning of her existence. The church is not a social organization to meet problem of migration or poverty. The church is a divine purpose to save the world. If Christ does not dwell within her church, tangibly, visibly, sacramentally, then what good news do we have to offer to the world? What is the meaning of evangelization? When Christians forget why they are Christian, the community must fall to de into decline. They forget the gospel and lose sight of their purpose. For those who still approach the Eucharist, if they lack faith, in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, they will likely receive him, but unworthily. So without result of progress in their Christian life, they thereby do violence to, the, to his body, bringing condemnation upon themselves and further hasting the community decline. To restore the church, we need only to listen to the word of Jesus Christ. This is my body. This is my blood. Christ is not merely a present in thought subjectively. When we gather for the Holy Mass, he is present to us in the most supreme manner, in his body, in his blood, in his soul, in his divinity, under the accidents of the Eucharist gift. We gives himself, he gives himself to us as food. He enters in our bodies and he does not disappear in us, but we are taken up to him. We dwell in him and him dwell in, in us. So beautiful is Holy Mass, if only for a moment we quiet ourselves and bring to consider the immensity of the Eucharist. Our faith in his presence must spring to life and lift our hearts to him. And maybe we can stay a little bit uh, on this um, also the sacredness of the liturgy. What role does, for example, um, maybe you can tell us more about the sacredness of the liturgy, but also what role does uh, silent adoration in front of the Eucharist play? And how do we lead people back today um, to the mystery of adoration, to appreciate adoration? In the Eucharist, we encounter Jesus Christ personally and intimately. Holy Mass is an essential part of Christian life. Christ himself tells us, do this in memory of me. But having encountered him in the liturgy, how can we not desire to spend time with him in silent adoration. 
the minutes and hours that we spend in his presence in the Eucharist continue his work in us by which he transform us and conform us to himself may uh, make us like that we are Christ himself and the liturgy is sacred it is our responsibility to conform ourselves to it to be shaped by the by the liturgy to reflect its holiness the liturgy is sacred it holy because it comes from God. It's not our invention, our creation. And when we encounter Christ in the Eucharist silently, we really change our life. We really become his disciples we really become Christian. This is quite clear from the least reflection upon what we are doing in the liturgy. We commemorate the death and the resurrection of our Lord by which he redeems us and draw us into him, into his divine life. The liturgy lead us to the divine life. And I will encourage that the liturgy become more and more sacred, more and more holy, more and more silent because God is silent and we encounter God in silence, in adoration. I think that the formation of the people of God to the liturgy is very important. We can learn people to the, to the beauty, to, re, to be reverent and to keep silent in the liturgy in which is deepened our encounter with Christ. I learned for during my, uh, as prophet of the sacred liturgy, I learned that liturgy must be a very great moment, very unique moment to encounter God face to face and to be transformed by him in children of God and a true worshiper of God. Liturgy must be beautiful, must be sacred, might be silent. I think that we must be more careful to when we are gathered for the Eucharist Mass, not, trans not to transform the sacred mass as a as a spectacle, as theater, as a phenomena of gathering people together because they are friend, but to worship God. And when we worship God silently, then God will transform our life. We become like God. St. Irene said God has made man that man became God. Deus homo factus es, ut homo fieret Deus. And the liturgy 
contribute to make us God. That is, it's very important to really make much progress in sacred liturgy. Not let people creating their own liturgy and make the liturgy dis desecrated, but make more uh, powerful as presence of God among the men. Among men. Thank you for that. Let me change gears here for a little bit. You also write about religious freedom, specifically the freedom to worship. Now, where do you see the greatest threats to this liberty? And how should the church and how should also liberal democracies respond to that? Certainly threats against religious liberty take many forms. Countless martyrs continue to die for the faith around the world. But the religious liberty is under threat in the West too. It is not often an overt threat or hatred of the faith, but a combination of implicit bias against Christianity. When we encounter very often laws created by government against the law of God, that is the thread of liberty, the thread of worshiping God. Anyway, uh, recently, through the pandemic, draconian restriction on the mass were widely accepted without objection. Certainly, it is good to protect human life, but not to consider what was given up that is hardly to live at all. Recall from the book of Exodus that the, the ten plagues, the departure of the, of the Hebrew and the destruction of, of Egypt occurred so that God's people might have the freedom to worship him properly. A religious liberty is not to be taken for granted or compromised or neglected. We are to assemble for the Holy Mass and to receive our Lord in the Eucharist. The Holy Mass and to receive the Lord, the Lord as he commanded us. We cannot forget this. The Eucharist is the source and summit of a Christian life. Adaptation is necessary at time. We'll face more pandemics and other emergencies. And there will be debate concerning how best to address this in relation to the celebration of the Eucharist. This is good. Liberal democracy requires debate, but never can be, never can the importance of, of our worship of, of God be forgotten or neglected in the course of debates. Liberal democracy must not forget God. Liberal democracies must also respect the non-negotiable value that is worshiping God. 
Christ possessed us that freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from worshiping in, in spirit and right and truth. We must not risk this freedom by neglecting the sacraments. Many have died during the pandemic without sacrament. We are obliged to suspend Eucharistic celebration for months. But we, man could not only cure of his body, but he has to cure his, his, his soul. So soul has, has been neglected. I think that uh, the church must fight to preserve his liberty of worshiping God and practicing the sacraments for the salvation of men and for the salvation of humanity. Because the Mass is powerful for everybody. It's not powerful only for Christian, but the Mass is powerful to save all the, all the humankind. So we have to fight to maintain our freedom of religious and, and worship. We must not risk this freedom by neglecting the sacrament by which he sustains us and he sustains his love in, in our life and con to conduct us in the divine life. I will fight myself again and again to maintain the liberty of the church, to conduct the people of God, to worship God like Moses did for the Hebrew people. That's why I think uh, I tried to write this book it's a comment on sacrament, baptism, uh, Eucharist, priesthood, and uh, even the, the sacrament of the sick. Uh, we have to, to talk about, not only about the life in this world, but about the life with God in eternity. This is evangelization, is to bring people to God, not to, to fight only for, the, for counseling or poverty or misery or human uh, poverty, but to bring God, to bring the people of God to the felicity, to, the, to God who is our real Uh, how can say our real richness? You know, God is our real richness, our the unique richness we have in in the world. So we have to fight for that, and not only to fight for human being uh, who will be rich, will be in any problem, any material problem. No, we have to fight for spiritual life because God has made us body and soul. Beautiful. Well, you were talking about um, also fighting for, for those values, for, for uh, God, also to, to, to describe God in the... In, um, to people to, to show that there is this he's the window to or the door to eternity but another important topic also in your book is more internal it's the spiritual battle 
And could you describe a little what is your understanding of what it means to, to have a spiritual battle? And has this battle changed over the centuries? Or do faithful face the same challenges today as in former times? Well, spiritual battle with evil is a part of Christian life. Christ himself went into the desert to contend with Satan. To do battle, we must be properly equipped. And our weapon is the Word of God. The letter to the Hebrews calls it a two aged sword in our hands. Christ himself appealed to scripture in the battle with Satan. You are weak and the world is full of temptation of evil and trace of evil. Constantly the demon seeks our ruin, our despair. Devil would like to make far from God. The victory of the church is assured by virtue of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the battle continues in, in each in our, of our hearts. Every day we are called to do battle, to discipline our minds and our bodies, and to turn again to God, to turn to the cross, and to suffer with Jesus Christ. By reading sacred scripture, we become more familiar with God. We learn to recognize his voice and to draw close to him in moment of temptation and moment of suffering. Spiritual battle is very much the same as it, it has been before. The Word of God has always been our weapon, and we must always turn to it. But it is sad that so many bishops or clergy have ceased to remind the faithful of the reality of spiritual welfare, of the need to turn to God every day, not just for, for, for consolation amidst worldly adversities, but because we depend upon him entirely in a cosmic struggle, we are all at war, whether we recognize it or not. It is good that all of us should become aware of the fact and make sure every day that we fight on the side of God. And the battle is every day more difficult, but we have the word of God, we have the prayer, and prayer is a great weapon, especially the rosary. So we have many weapons. We have the word of God, we have the rosary, we have the prayer, we have the proximity of God, that are our weapons. But the battle is the same today as it was in the previous time. And we have the same weapons, the word of God, 
the proximity of God and the rosary. You also mentioned your book, the, the ultimate weapon uh, in the spiritual battle um, is penance. But why, at the same time, we see that many refuse or ignore also the gift of confession. They do not go to confession anymore. They don't think it's important or, or play it down. And even in church and during Holy Mass, it has become unpopular to confess our sinful nature. What's your explanation for this? Well, confession appears at the very origin of the gospel. Jesus said to us, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The, at the beginning, Christ commanded to confess, to repent. Repentance is the beginning of divine life. The restoration of our friendship with God. The sacrament of confession is the wonderful f gift by which God again and again restore us into his grace. We ought to welcome in our heart sorrow of our sins, which is the work of the Holy Spirit, and receive the liberty from sin that comes with repentance. We ought to make an habit of this, turning again and again, day after day, to the Lord, escaping quickly the despair, the deception of this world. Rather than embrace the gift of confession, too many have come to resent it. In doing this, they resent the truth, that is the truth that they are a sinner in need of God's mercy. Unfortunately, we have lost the recent, in recent dec decades, the sense of sin. Many didn't accept that man is sinner. There is no sin today. Perhaps, too, some of the faithful resent confession because they cannot submit to the authority of priests. So many of those of, of whose reputation are ruined by the atrocity of sexual abuse committed, committed by few priests. But this rebellion is mistaken because confession has nothing to do with the personal, wit with personal worthiness of the priests. The priest must be a sinner, but through the priest is Christ to forgive. So we didn't have to look at the priests who is sinner. Through the priest, it is Christ who forgives. We all require his forgiveness. And he would pass through the priests. And no, mi no mis mis mistrust or resentment of the priest can be make us far from the confession. We know that St. Augustine said, when Peter baptized, 
is Christ who baptized. When Judah baptized, is Christ who baptized. If a sinner baptized in the name of the Jesus of, of, the, of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit, is the Christ who baptized. So it doesn't matter what priest is in the confessional. We have to go to him and rec recognize our sins, and God will forgive us. So I think the the main problem today is this spread bad news that many priests have been um, in a very scandalous situation by abusing little children. But it's very few priests who do that. But we have so many priests very faithful. Let's go to, to them and confess our sins. This is a very great weapon to fight against evil present in, the, in our life and the li in, the, in the life of the world. So I think this is the ultimate weapon that God gives us, the confession of our sins, to have forgiveness of our, of our sins. And if you allow me to, um, to come back to, to, the, to the Eucharist, why, why is, is the celebration of the Eucharist the center of spiritual life? The good news is that Jesus Christ, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, became man so that we might be restored through him in friendship with the Father. Definitive act of which he revealed us to his mission and the foundation of our friendship with God is his passion, his death, his resurrection. At the last supper, Jesus established the Eucharist, anticipating this definitive act in the very last hours before he would fulfill the earthly mission. He prefigured it and made it something to be perpetuated forever among the community of his friend, that is the church. This is why the Eucharist is the source and the summit of Christian life. It is the self-revelation of God upon the cross and the means by which he restored us to friendship with himself. It is our participation in his sufferings, in his sacrifice, by which we are configured into him, progressively transformed by his grace. The sacrament of Eucharist recapitulates all salvation history and draws us into salvation. The Eucharist is really allowing God to enter in my life and I enter in his life and become one real person. We become one reality who eat my body will d dwell in me and me in him. So the Eucharist is really the center of our life. The Eucharist is our life himself. So we have to celebrate Eucharist 
with faith, with sacredness, with love, and total confidence in Jesus Christ who gave himself to us. The Eucharist is major sacrament, the most holy sacrament that Christ gave us for our life eternal. We priest and we bishop must celebrate the Eucharist with holiness, with sacredness that we can really enter in the love of Jesus Christ and let Jesus Christ enter in our life. This is the great sacrament we have and we have to keep this sacrament in very great respect, very great uh, love. And we thank you for uh, having published my book in which I reflect especially on sacraments, on prayer, and the cross. The cross is really uh, the pillar in which we have to build our life. I most especially say that a Christian life must be built on three, on three pillars. Cro crooks, hostia, and Virgo, the cross, the host, and the Virgin Mary. These are the three pillars who, in which we have to build our Christian life. I encourage you to, to build your life in these three pillars and you'll see how beautiful it is to be Christian, how beautiful it is to be in the family of God, that is the church. Wonderful. Um, maybe for the last question, could you also tell us a little bit how this sacrament, how the Eucharist is challenged today in the West and also uh, maybe more particularly even in, in, in the church itself? Well, I think in my vision, um, we neglected for a long time the catechism. That means to form the people of God on the gifts of God to his church. And sometimes we just celebrate the sacrament as a cultural rites, like um, well, a social meeting. I think we have to re to rediscover the richness and the mind of God, who would like to give His own life to us. And, and to celebrate it very carefully, not to I'm not criticizing, but I think we have to to continue what Christ gave us. The, the, the liturgy, the sacrament of the Eucharist is celebrated in tradition. What Christ did, the apostles followed him and the father of the church in the history tried to follow what Christ did. And we must remain in this tradition. I think it is a great challenge today if we damage 
the sacrament of the Eucharist, then we damage the church. If we damage the liturgy, we damage the faith of, ch of the church. Lex orandi, lex credendi. The way we pray, the way we believe. The way we believe is the way we pray. So I think it's very important that uh, we have to follow what Christ did and what the tradition did. Because a tree, a big tree, if he it lost his roots, will die. Even um, if if I I, I, I lose my, my origin, my cultural origin, then I will die. So I think we have to be very kind, not to believe that we have to transform everything, to adapt everything. Uh, yes, we have to do that, but maintaining our roots in the tradition, maintaining our faith in a way that the church before us lived the faith and celebrate the faith. You know. uh, it is a great challenge today uh, uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, um, will succeed to to overcome this challenge if you remain faithful to God and to tradition. Yeah, Eminence, thank you very much. I'm very honored for being here and listening and, and hearing your, um, your explanations also about this book. Thank you for writing this book also. Anything that you would like to add? Well, I would like to thank, to thank you for giving me the opportunity to explain very badly what I intended to write, to communicate to the people of God. But, but my intention was really to help the people of God to enter to the mysteries of the sacrament. It is great to be baptized because we enter in the life of God. We, we become children and of God. It is great to be a priest because a priest and even a Christian is not only an altar Christus, but he is Ipse Christus, is Christ himself. So we have to be very proud to be, a Christ, to be priests and to live the priesthood with sacredness. It is beautiful to be confirmed, to be soldier of Christ, to fight for Christ. It's an honor. That's why I was like to to explain that we have not to delay even the confirmation because if we delay the Satan will occupy the place of the Holy Spirit. We have to confirm as soon as possible to make the our heart the temple of God, of the Holy Spirit. It is great to be married. The marriage is a very great sacrament. It is the mystery that celebrates the union with Christ, with Christ uh, between Christ and His Church. So, if every Christian could live, could live properly 
his marriage it is great sacrament because we concretize the links between the church and Christ and this link is perpetual so uh, what I try to explain in this book is really to discover again and again this great gift we have received from Jesus Christ before leaving our world to make us capable to live the life of God. That I was like to uh, was the, uh, would like to, to aid, uh, and I thank you for making known my not my ideas, but the idea of the church, because I didn't invent anything. I just transmit the teaching of the church. So thank you for for make, making known my my book. And um, I pray for all the who is reading this book and that he may discover the richness of the sacraments. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you indeed.